Section 18 of Black Experience in America, 18th through 20th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sunday School and Church as a Solution of the Negro Problem by D. Webster Davis, Doctor of Divinity. Reading by Matt Perard. Black Experience in America, 18th through 20th Century, by Various, Section 18. Delivered at the International Interdenominational Sunday School Convention, Massey Hall, Toronto, Canada, June 27, 1905. If I were asked to name the most wonderful and far-reaching achievement of the splendid, all-conquering Anglo-Saxon race, I would ignore the pass of Thermopylae, the immortal six hundred, at Balaclava, Trafalgar, Waterloo, Quebec, Bunker Hill, Yorktown, and Appomattox. I would forget its marvelous accumulations of wealth, its additions to the literature of the world, and point to the single fact that it has done the most to spread the religion of Jesus Christ, as the greatest thing it has accomplished for the betterment of the human family. The Jews preserved the idea of a one God, and gave the ethics to religion. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Sermon on the Mount. The Greeks contributed philosophy, the Romans, polity, the Teutons, liberty, and breadth of thought but it remained to the anglo-saxon implicitly to obey the divine command go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature if some man would ask me the one act on the part of my own race that gives to me the greatest hope for the negro's ultimate elevation to the heights of civilization and culture i would not revel in ancient lore to prove them the pioneers in civilization nor would i point to their marvellous progress since emancipation that has surprised their most sanguine friends but i would take the single idea of their unquestioned acceptance of the dogmas and tenets of the christian religion as promulgated by the anglo-saxon as the highest evidence of the future possibilities of the race ours was indeed a wonderful faith that overleaped the barriers of ecclesiastical juggling to justify from holy writ the iniquitous traffic in human flesh and blood. Forgot the glaring inconsistencies of a religion that prayed on Sunday, Our Father, which art in heaven, and on Monday sold a brother who, though cut in ebony, was yet the image of the divine. The negro had, in very truth, the faith that would not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that would not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that faith that shone more bright and clear when trials reigned without, that, when in danger, knew no fear, in darkness felt no doubt. If it is indeed true that by faith are ye saved, not only is this world, but in the world to come, then God will vouchsafe to us a most abundant salvation. It is my blessed privilege tonight, while you are pleading for the winning of a generation, and at this special session for the relation of the Sunday School to missions, both home and foreign, to plead for my people, and my prayer is that God may help me to make my plea effective. For the people for whom I plead are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I plead for help for my own bright-eyed boy and girl, and for all the little black boys and girls in my far-off southern home. If the great race problem is to be settled, and it is a problem, notwithstanding all that has been said to the contrary, it is to be settled not in blood and carnage, not by material wealth and accumulation of lands and houses, not in literary culture, nor on the college campus, not in industrial education, 
or in the marts of trade, but by the religion of him who said, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. These things are resultant factors in the problem, but the problem itself lies far deeper than these. Calhoun is reported to have said, If I could find a Negro who could master the Greek syntax, I would believe in his possibilities of development. A comparatively few years have passed away, and a Negro not only masters the Greek syntax, but writes a Greek grammar accepted as authority by some of the ablest scholars of the states. But Abbe Gregory of France published in the 15th century Literature of the Negro, telling of the achievements of Negro writers, scholars, priests, philosophers, painters, and Roman prelates in Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, Holland, and Turkey, which prompted Blumenbach to declare it would be difficult to meet with such in the French Academy. And yet, literature and learning have not settled the problem. No, the religion of Jesus Christ is the touchstone to settle all the problems of human life. More than 1900 years ago, Christ gave solution when he said, Ye are brethren. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Is the Negro in any measure deserving of the help for which I plead? The universal brotherhood and common instincts of humanity should be enough. I bring more. Othello, in speaking of Desdemona, says, She loved me for the dangers I had passed. I loved her, that she did pity me. If pity and suffering can awaken sympathy, then we boldly claim our right to the fullest measure of consideration. Two hundred and fifty years of slavery, with all its attendant evils, is one of our most potent weapons to enlist sympathy and aid. I come with no bitterness to North or South. For slavery, I acknowledge all the possible good that came to us from it, the contact with superior civilization, the knowledge of the true God, the crude preparation for citizenship, the mastery of some handicraft. Yet, slavery had its side of suffering and degradation. North and South rejoice that it is gone forever, and yet many of its evils cling to us, like the old man of the sea to Sinbad the sailor, and like Banquo's ghost, they haunt us still. As I stand here tonight, my mind is carried back to a plantation down in old Virginia. It is the first day of January, 1864. Lincoln's immortal proclamation is a year old, and yet I see an aunt of mine, the unacknowledged offspring of her white master, being sent away from the old homestead to be sold. The proud Anglo-Saxon blood in her veins will assert itself, as she resists with all the power of her being the attempts of the overseer to ply lash to her fair skin, and for this she must be sold way down south. I see her now as she comes down from the great house, chained to twelve others, to be carried to Lumpkin's jail in Richmond, to be put upon the block. She had been united to a slave of her choice some two years before, and a little innocent babe had been born to them. The husband, my mother, with the babe in her arms, and other slaves, watch them from the big gate as they come down to the road to go to their destination some twenty miles away. As she saw us, great tears welled up in her big black eyes. Not a word could she utter as she looked her last sad farewell. She thought of one of the old slave songs we used to sing in the cabin prayer meetings at night as we turned up the pots and kettles and filled them with water to drown the sound. Being blessed, as is true of most of my race, with a splendid voice, she raised her eyes and began to sing, Brethren, fare you well, brethren, fare you well. May God Almighty bless you until we meet again. Singing these touching lines, she passed out of sight. 
More than forty years have passed, and she and her loved ones have never met again, unless they have met in the morning land, where partings are no more. For the sufferings we have endured, leaving their traces indelibly stamped upon us, I claim your aid that we may have for our children this blessed gospel, the panacea for all human ills. The Negro has elements in his nature that make him peculiarly susceptible to religious training. He stands as a monument to faithfulness to humble duty, one of the highest marks of the Christ life. He is humble and faithful, but not from cowardice, in evidence of which I recall his achievements at Boston, Bunker Hill, New Orleans, Milliken's Bend, Wilson's Landing, and San Juan Hill. He fought when a slave, some would say, from compulsion, but would he fight for love of the flag of the Union? God gave him a chance to answer the question at San Juan Hill. The story is best understood as told to me by one of the brave Ninth Cavalry as he lay wounded at Old Point Comfort, Virginia. Up go the splendid rough riders amid shot and shell from enemies, concealed in fields, trees, ditches, and the blockhouse on the hill. The galling fire proves too much for them, and back they come. A second and third assault proves equally unavailing. They must have help. Help arrives in the form of a colored regiment. See them as they come, black as the sable plume of midnight, yet irresistible as the terrible cyclone. As is the custom of my race under excitement of any kind, they are singing, not, My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, though fighting willingly for the land that gave them birth, not the bonny blue flag. Though they were willing to die for the flag they loved, they sing a song never heard on battlefield before. There's a hot time in the old town tonight. On they come, trampling on the dead bodies of their comrades. They climb the hill. To the rear, is the command. To the front, they cry. And leaderless, with officers far in the rear, they plant the flag on San Juan Hill and prove to the world that Negroes can fight for love of country. They were faithful to humble duty in the dark days of the South from 1861 to 1865. When Jefferson Davis had called for troops until he had well nigh decimated the fair Southland, and even boys, in their devotion to the cause they loved dearly, were willing to go to the front, my young master came to my old mistress and asked to be allowed to go. Calling my uncle Isaac, my old mistress said to him, Isaac, go along with your young Mars Edmund, take good care of him, and bring him home to me. Agwe do de best I can, was his reply. Off these two went, amid the tears of the whole plantation, and we heard no more of them for some time. One night we were startled to hear the dogs howling down in the pasture lot, always to the southern heart a forewarning of death. A few nights thereafter my mother heard a tapping on the kitchen window, and, on going to the door, saw Uncle Isaac standing there, alone. What in the world are you doing here? was the question of my mother. What's mistis? was the interrogative answer. My mother went to call the mistress, who, white as a sheet, repeated the question. Mistis, I done de best I could. Going a few paces from the door, while the soft southern moon shone pitilessly through the solemn pines, he brought the dead body of his young master, and laid it tenderly at his mother's feet. He had brought his dead massa on his back, a distance of more than twenty miles from the battlefield, thus faithfully keeping his promise. Such an act of devotion can never be forgotten, while memory holds its sacred office. Not one case of nameless crime was ever heard in those days, though the flower of the womanhood of the South was left practically helpless in the hands of black men in southern plantations. But as a faithful watchdog stands and guards with jealous eye, he cared for master's wife and child, and at the door would lie, 
to shed his blood in their defense against traitors, thieves, and knaves, although those masters went to fight to keep them helpless slaves. Some have claimed that, instead of putting so much money in churches, the Negro, after the war, should have built mills and factories, and thus would have advanced more rapidly in civilization. But I rejoice that he did build churches, and today can say that of the three hundred millions he has accumulated, more than forty millions are in church property in the sixteen southern states. This shows his fidelity and gratitude to God, and that by intuition he had grasped the fundamental fact that faith and love and morality are greater bulwarks for the perpetuity of a nation than material wealth that somehow he was in accord with God's holy mandate, that man does not live by bread alone. Guided by a superior wisdom, he first sought the kingdom of heaven, and it does seem that all these things are slowly being added to him. Education and wealth, unsanctified by the grace of God, are, after all, curses rather than a blessing. We are to rise, not by our strong bodies, our intellectual powers, or material wealth, although these are necessary concomitants, but by the virtue, character, and honesty of our men and women. We are proud of our 30,000 teachers, 2,000 graduated doctors, 1,000 lawyers, 20,000 ordained ministers, 75,000 businessmen, 400 patentees, and 250,000 farms, all paid for as evidences of our possibilities, but proudest of the fact that nearly three millions of our almost ten millions of Negroes are professing Christians. It is true that the black man is not always the best kind of a Christian. He is often rather crude in worship, with a rather hazy idea of the connection between religion and morality. A colored man, on making a loud profession of religion, was asked if he were going to pay a certain debt he had contracted, remarked, "Ligion is ligion, and business is business, and I ain't gwa mix em. Yet I am afraid ours is not the only race that fails to mix em, and he does not have to go far to find others with advantages far superior to his, who have not reached the delectable mountain. We, like others, are seeking higher ground, and some have almost reached it. Thank God we can point to thousands of Negro Christians whose faith is as strong as that of the prophets of old, and whose lives are as pure and sweet as the morning dew. Our greatest curse today is the rum shop, kept far too often by men of the developed and forward race to filch from us our hard earnings and give us shame and misery in return and a man who would deliberately debauch and hinder a backward race struggling for the light, would rob the dead, steal the orphan's bread, pillage the palace of the king of kings, and clip the angel's pinions while they sing. Right by the side of this hindrance, especially in the country districts, is our ignorant, and in too many cases, venial ministry. For ignorance is the greatest curse on earth, save sin. The Sunday school is destined to be the most potent factor in the removal of this evil. As our children see the light as revealed in the Sunday school by the teachers of God's word, they will demand an intelligent and moral ministry, and will support no other. Let me say to you that there is no agency doing more in that absolutely necessary and fundamental line than this God-sent association. Wherever your missionaries have gone, there have been magical and positive changes for good, and the elevating power of this work for us can never be told. God bless the thousands of Sunday school teachers whose names may never be known outside their immediate circles, and yet are doing a work so grand and noble that angels would delight to come down and bear them company. There is a beautiful story told in Greek mythology that when Ulysses was passing in his ship by the Isle of the Sirens, the beautiful sirens began to play their sweetest music to lure the sailors from their posts of duty. Ulysses and his sailors stuffed wax in their ears and lashed themselves to the masts 
that they might not be lured away. But when Orpheus passed by in the search of the Golden Fleece and heard the same sweet songs, he simply took out his harp and played sweeter music, and not a sailor desired to leave the vessel. The sirens of sin and crime are doing all in their power to lure us from the highest and best things in life. Wealth, education, political power are, after all, but wax in the ears, the ropes that may or may not hold us to the masts of safety. But that sweeter music of the heart, played on the harp of love by the great Sunday school movement, continue to play for us this sweeter music, and no sirens can lure us away from truth and right and heaven. The mission that will be of real help to us will be the mission dictated by love, for no race is more susceptible to kindness than ours. It must be undertaken in the spirit of the master, who said, I call ye not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his lord doeth, but I have called you friends. The negro loves his own and is satisfied to be with them, and yet the man who would really help him must be a man who has seen the vision. Peter was unwilling to go to the Gentiles, being an Orthodox Jew, until God put him in a trance upon the housetop, let down the sheet from heaven with all manner of beasts, and bid him rise up, slay, and eat. Peter strenuously objected, saying, Lord, I have touched nothing unclean. But God said, What I have cleansed, call thou not unclean? Then Peter said, I see of a truth that God is no respecter of persons, but has made of one blood all men to dwell upon all the face of the earth. I pray, I believe, that you have seen this vision, and in the spirit have come to help us. Sir Longfall, in searching for the Holy Grail, found it in ministering to the suffering and diseased at his own door. Ye who are in search of God's best gift can find it today in lifting up these ten millions of people at your door, broken by slavery, bound by ignorance, yet groping for the light. If we go down in sin and ignorance, we cannot go alone, but must contaminate and curse millions unborn. If we go up, as in God's name, we will, we will constitute the brightest star in your crown. What religion has done for others, it will do for us. See the triumphs of King Emmanuel in Africa, Burma, China, and the Isles of the Sea. It was Christianity that liberated four millions of slaves and brought them to their better position. Christian men, north and south, are helping them today. We could not rise alone. Has the Negro made improvement commensurate with the help he has received from north and south? I believe he has and that each year finds him better than the last. Good Dr. Talmage was visiting a parishioner when a little girl sat on his knee. Seeing his seamed and wrinkled face, she asked, Doctor, did God make you? Yes, was the reply. Then, looking at her own sweet rosy face in a glass opposite, she asked, Did God make me, too? Yes. Did God make me after he made you? Yes, my child. Why? Looking again at his face and hers, she said, Well, doctor, God is doing better work these days. God bless our mothers and fathers. No nobler souls ever lived under such circumstances. But God has answered their prayers, and with the young folks will do better work. The convention helps us to help ourselves, the only true help, and in this the conveners are investing in soul power that pays the biggest dividends, and its bonds are always redeemable at the bank of heaven. In a terrible storm at sea, when all the passengers were trembling with fear, one little boy stood calm and serene. Why so calm, my little man? asked one. My father runs the ship was the reply. I have too much confidence in what religion has done, and too much faith in what it can do, to be afraid. 
God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Let each do his part to help on the cause. There is never a rose in all the world, but makes some green spray sweeter. There is never a wind in all the sky, but makes some bird's wing fleeter. There is never a star but brings to earth some silvery radiance tender, and never a sunset cloud but helps to cheer the sunset splendor. No robin but may cheer some heart, its dawnlight gladness voicing. God gives us all some small sweet way to set the world rejoicing. America, I believe, is destined of God to be the land that shall flow with milk and honey, the king's highway, when the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I see gathered upon our fair western plain nations of all the earth. The Italian is there, and thinks of Italia, fair Italia. The Frenchman sings his Marseillaise. The solid phlegmatic German sings his Die Wacht am Rhein. The Irish sing Killarney and Wearing the Green. The Scotchman his Bluebells. The Englishman, God Save the King. The American, the Star Spangled Banner. God bless the patriot, but the ultimate end of all governments is that the kingdom of Christ may prevail. One towering Christian man thinks of this, and, seeing a black man standing by without home or country, remembers that all are Christ's, and Christ's is God's. He swings a baton high in air and starts a grand hallelujah chorus, for God is all else as the grand chorus white and black, of every age and every clime, sing till heaven's arches ring again, while angels from the battlements of heaven listen and wave anew the palm branches from the trees of paradise, and the angels' choir that sang on the plains of Bethlehem more than nineteen hundred years ago join in the grand refrain. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him lord of all. End of section 18